So, so while, while Tia, Tia is setting up her slides, uh, I want to answer a, a question that many people asked me since this morning. And the question was, when will we move to Vienna? Because you heard from our rector when we move to Vienna. The short answer is that not yet, not in this academic year and not in the next academic year. The earliest point where we can move is practically the middle, middle of 21. The second question many people ask me, what will happen with the BCCCD? And the, I can just tell you that the plan is that it stays at it, where it is. So it's the B in the BCCCD is Budapest. We, 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 we plan to keep it in Budapest. Okay, so then the next speaker is introduced by Mark Johnson. Good afternoon, um, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Mark Johnson, and it's my pleasure to, you know, introduce the next speaker, Theod you know, Theodore Gliga. But first of all, I wanted to, um, jo you know, yeah, yeah, to join the praise and, uh, you know, yeah, 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 the, yeah, 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 the congratulations actually for George and Gergo um, for the way they built up the centre here, both both our, our the centre and the annual meeting and the department, and of course the wonderful baby lab, which I saw yesterday, which is extremely impressive, and I left feeling very envious, I must say. Um, so, yeah, and um, I'm sure things will will yeah, yeah will um, continue to, to thrive going you know going into the f to the future, regardless of whether it be. The, yeah, yeah, they'd be in Vienna or here or, or some combination of the two. Uh, but on to um, today's speaker, uh, Theod you know, you know, Theodora Gliga. Uh, so in about 2005, I think, 2005, 2004, 2005, Gregor, you know, Gregor and I um, had a number of postdoctoral um, um, you know, positions in London, and we, you know, you know, we interviewed a number of, of uh, um, um, people, did a global search, and we ended up, um, you know, appointing three people, actually. Um, we had Vicky Southgate, who is here, here, here today, uh, Toby Grossman, who I think has been to previous meetings here, and Theodora Gliga. Yeah, yeah, I tried to persuade Gergo to, 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 to let me nominate three lecturers, but unfortunately that wasn't possible. I can only have one. So um, <laughs> Taya is going to be speaking to, you know, to you today. All three of, of, of these, po you know, you know, these postdocs took, took, you know, took, I think, uh, you know, a little bit of the best bits of Gergo and a little bit of the best bits of me, uh, and then went off in their own direction to actually do stuff that neither Gergo nor, you know, nor I, I um, would have even thought of doing uh, you know, on our own. Uh, so Taya herself has gone on to um, um, do, yeah, 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 do, you know, you know, to do some wide-ranging study, studies. Actually, um, you know, basically trying to investigate the factors that you know underlie how young children, you know, you know, explore their sensory environment and their sensory world and construct concepts um, um, from that information. Um, she's very broad in, you know, you know, in her research program, studying both, both typical and atypical um, development, and, uh, uh, you know, and also all, you know, all of the sensory channels. So, so she's done a lot of work, work, uh, work recently on tactile perception and touch, which I don't know if she'll be talking about today or not. No, okay, but um, she could have talked about her work on touch, on touch, touch today. Uh, just a few career la landmarks for Taya. Um, so Taya began as a, a biologist, you know, um, in Romania and Lyon in France, and then she uh, saw the light, if you like, and decided to do a master's course in cognitive science in Paris. She then did a PhD with um, Ghislaine Dehan in in Paris, finishing I think about 2005, 2006, six, and then. You know, as I said, in 2006, she came to London, where she's worked on, you know, on, on several different projects. Um, and she stayed in London for 12 years, remarkably, um, which was really, you know, really nice. And then 2018, uh, Teo decided to, to seek passages new, and she moved as associate professor to, U, to, to UEA, which is the University of East Anglia, which is in, which is in the lovely city of uh, Norwich. 
so actually, you know, you know, UEA, you know, um, Taya is associate professor and she is director of the MSc in developmental science. So, so without further ado, you know, let me hand you over to Taya. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, it's really a great honor to be here uh, amongst amazing speakers, and uh, I really hope to deserve this honor one day. Um, so before starting, I uh, want to thank uh, the two people that uh, have been really instrumental in uh, driving what I'm going to say today. Um, so the first is uh, Gergo Chira here, who has inspired this work uh, many years ago, and who continues to inspire it and, and challenge it. Um, and then uh, the second is uh, Basia Pomichowska, who was uh, um, a PhD student with me and who is now at CEU, and who has actually done all the hard work that I'm going to uh, be presenting today. So my talk uh, is based on a fundamental um, a property of language and which is that words refer to categories. Um, so despite the fact that in the process of learning words, particular exemplars are labeled, uh, most of the words in, in human languages refer to categories rather than particular exemplars. And the uh, young children must discover uh, the, the extension of words or generalize. So I'm going to be asking a question of how they do this. Um, and I'm not I'm going to attempt uh, uh, to create an exercise in thinking not only about what they can do uh, in, in lung cognition, but also what mechanisms uh, are available to them there in the outside world, where information may be experienced in different ways than in the lab. And to me, this is... Uh, Important also because uh, this is where I have to, to thank Mark. Uh, um, being working with him, um, I uh, I learned how to think about individual differences. Uh, uh, so this for me was a, always a uh, there was always an interesting divide working with Gergo, who doesn't care about individual differences, and <laughs> uh, and, and Mark, um, um, and and. I, I do find individual difference fascinating, and I think particular with respect to this topic, um, I think it is important to think about uh, uh, environmental differences and how they may affect world learning. Now, another thing I have to say is that I, I took uh, Gergo's uh, suggestion uh, to uh, produce a controversial talk quite seriously, uh, so I thought that one way to do that is um, write a talk with a lot of speculation and not a lot of hard data, so we'll see how that will go. Um, so, going back to, to the topic, so uh, generalization. This is uh, basically to remind you something that you all here are familiar with, that generalization is a hard job uh, for young infants. So although um, for you uh, being told that this object uh, it's called a moxie. It's quite an easy job to find which of these two uh, objects uh, may share the same label, even if you didn't already know that those were staplers. Um, this is something that young infants uh, cannot do. So, um, so we uh, know from various studies that 10 months olds, 12 months olds uh, have difficulty uh, making this. Um, um, uh, judgment and even older infants, so 18 months old, uh, they, they struggle uh, to, to fast map in this uh, situation unless the objects have been stripped of a lot of detail, so they, they have become very simple. Um, and if you think that maybe this is uh, an artifact of using artifacts, so things that maybe infants are not um, able to, to parse into features. Actually, in the study, uh, Taxi Target 2019, they, they have used cows and airplanes, um, so uh, which they made sure that the infants didn't have labels for. So giving a cow a new label, these 10 months olds were not able to map the same label on a different cow over an airplane. So clearly, these uh, this similar similarities do not stand out, and uh, uh, it takes uh, many months, uh, years, for infants to produce this fast mapping, which is based on deriving heuristics like the shape bias, uh, which we believe uh, are derived through observing that many uh, labels, basic level labels, refer to categories that are defined by shape. 
But despite the fact that this is difficult to produce in a lab with young infants, we know that uh, very young infants, nine to 12 months of age, they uh, associated labels with categories and they can generalize. So this is from work uh, by Erika Bergerson and Dan Swingley. So uh, what they show there is that uh, infants younger than one year of age, they uh, uh, recognize um, uh, or know, have knowledge of, uh, of the names uh, of uh, uh, examples that they have never seen before. So they show these infants pictures of uh, various objects that they have never seen before, which were depicting hands, apples, yogurt, or spoon, for example. So clearly infants this young have mapped uh, um, object, uh, labels onto categories. Now what is required uh, to, to make this, um, uh, to be able to generalize? So the two things that are required, um, so one is uh, obviously uh, infants have to have extracted what is the category defining uh, property. Uh, so the, the handness, for example, in this case. Uh, and the second thing is and to associate a label to, uh, uh, to this category representation. And um, just to say that I'm, I'm going to make things uh, simple, I'm going to refer here uh, to categories, categories as being defined by observable, observable visual features. Uh, it's a question of whether they're observed, but they are observable. Um, and this is, these are actually the most common categories that have been used uh, in word learning in infancy nowadays. So, um, so this is what the, the, the two uh, uh, processes or associations that infants have to, uh, to achieve, but there are two ways, uh, at least in which they, they can achieve this. So one of these ways is to um, discover uh, the extension of words uh, through labeling of various examplars. So this is something that um, uh, Nelson had uh, referred to as category identification, and this is because uh, infants learn the category uh, and the, the word alongside. So they identify the category uh, uh, in the process of labeling these various exemplars. But then there's also another uh, way of doing this, and which uh, she referred to as category matching. And this is to uh, first learn the category independent of language, um, and then to associate the label to this category representation. So in this case, um, this would uh, uh, again occur through the labeling of one of these exemplars, but this example uh, is perceived as a, a category placeholder, and then actually this, uh, this event will lead to the, the mapping of the label to the whole category. Now, which uh, of these uh, um, strategies are used uh, in, uh, in word learning? So what I'm going to do in the rest of the talk is um, first uh, try to uh, convince you that category matching is the likely and desirable strategy, and then I'm going to convince you that it is not the likely strategy. And based on uh, Olivier's talk, uh, you have the strong assumption that I am coherent and you will uh, go with the second proposal <laughs> as in the, the case. So, first of all, um, do e are infants able to use one or the other strategy? Um, to those of you that have done work on early word learning, you know that it's actually quite hard to teach infants, uh, wor very young infants, uh, words in the lab. Uh, so there's not a huge amount of evidence for infants using strategy, but there is some evidence. So in terms of category identification, uh, there is uh, ERP evidence that nine months old presented with labels associated with various exemplars, generalize those labels to new exemplars, um, and 10 months old uh, uh, do the same um, for natural categories um, in a behavioral study. Um, and there's also evidence for category matching. So uh, here one case is a study uh, by uh, Ian and Chibra in which they show that infants uh, associate a new label to a pre-existing uh, concept, in that case the concept of ch chasing, and they also cannot associate a label to an uh, um, unavailable concept like being chased. 
although um, actually in, in this particular study, they, these infants do experience uh, um, chasing and the label a few times, so it's not very clear actually whether this is a category identification or matching situation. But um, uh, some years ago with, uh, with Basia, we have actually uh, put together a random study in which we show that infants uh, can associate a, a word to a category they had just learned in the absence of language in the lab. So this is um, um, what we taught infants. So we uh, um, uh, introduced them to two new categories, staplers and coffee makers here. And we taught them those categories through repeated exposure to various exemplars of the two. So first, lots of staplers and then lots of um, coffee makers. And we have tested that they have indeed learned these categories in you know, a separate uh, a group of, uh, um, of infants um, uh, using a novelty preference uh, paradigm. So we showed that these categories had been um, had been learned. And then what we did is we labeled only one new exemplar of this category, of each of these categories. Um, and this was sufficient, so labeling only one example was sufficient for them in subsequent trials to now generalize this word to yet other new examplars of these categories that they have not seen before. Um, okay, so uh, these infants can use uh, both these strategies. But which of these strategies are they likely to use in real life? So this is what um, uh, I'm trying to uh, try to answer. Uh, and you may think, oh, since they both are uh, available, then probably they may be using both. But actually, depending on who you ask, they may be biased to think that one of these strategies is more likely than, than others. So for example, um, based on a lot of work done by Sandy Waxman or uh, Nadia Althaus, um, it is actually suggested that learning category is very difficult without language. Um, so since category matching is uh, based on this uh, assumption that the category has been learned in absence of language and is later labeled, um, then this work uh, makes that unlikely and suggests that maybe category identification is what infants mostly do in their daily lives. However, there is uh, equally, if not more, uh, evidence for the fact that uh, very young infants can learn a variety of categories in the absence of language. And they, uh, they can learn, um, even four months old can learn things like a uh, category of dogs or chairs or even uh, uh, more um, superordinate categories like mammals. They can learn categories that are more abstract, like horizontal uh, versus vertical patterns or above or versus below, so relational categories. Um, and around one year of age, they can learn uh, categories defined by an action uh, path or by a manner of an action. And they do this through simply repeated exposure to various exemplars of this, uh, of this category or instances of these actions. So this uh, actually uh, made some people uh, think that the rest of the, the previous studies in which uh, labels seem uh, to be necessary for category learning indicate that maybe certain categories are different than others and may require labels, or maybe the labels, so they may, they may uh, um, speed up learning, they are not critical. In addition, some people uh, um, suggest that well, labeling uh, may not be a very common thing in infant's daily life, and uh, something that the Marjorie uh, alluded to early on as well. So there is, for example, some uh, evidence where uh, parents and child were recording during uh, the meal times uh, by um, Clerking and Smith, and they, in those recordings, they do not see a lot of uh, instances of labeling, and when they occur, they don't seem to actually refer to anything in the infant's um, environment at the moment. So maybe category matching is actually the more likely and more efficient way because uh, uh, it is uh, less reliant on input that seems to not be available anyhow. Um, so category matching would just allow infants to learn categories as they go about their daily lives. Uh, and then the rare instance of labeling, uh, uh, they would now also acquire the label, which would be immediately uh, mapped, extended to all the category members. Uh, why why uh, I think uh, 
this question of asking which of this is possible is interesting also uh, because of this idea of resilience uh, in impoverished environments. And I'm thinking here not necessarily of fans who don't have the time to label things, but also of cases in which la uh, language is not available. And these are not cases of feral children, uh, but there are cases that occur actually nowadays. So there are um, infants that are born deaf to, to hearing families. Uh, and what happens in this situation is that it takes some time for parents to realize that the, the child is not uh, hearing, and then also these parents have nothing, no other means of communication to provide. So what happens in this situation is that uh, children may be actually deprived of linguistic input uh, until either the decision made to use sign language or until cochlear implantation, which is now possible uh, to do as early as one year of age. But also, uh, so although for some time uh, this population, they were encouraged to introduce sign language uh, as early as possible, now there's some newer work which suggests that using sign language may interfere with later use of, uh, of spoken language. So they, they are uh, discouraging its use. So this is uh, problematic, but of course, if uh, uh, category matching is available to these children, then uh, this could be actually highly protective because these children could learn a variety of uh, category and conceptual distinctions in the absolute language and then finally when language is given back to them after cochlear implantation, they could just simply map words to existing categories and uh, do better. However, um, Revere 2 provided some thought-provoking feedback and thank you if you are in the audience. Uh, um, yeah, I have to say I, I, I'm always very thankful to, to reviewers. Um, uh, I, I never have anything uh, to say against this very constructive review. Um, so what did, this was a, a feedback um, a given in response to a, a, a control condition that we ran in the study. Uh, basically because we wanted to, to show that Category knowledge is critical for a generalization in this, uh, in this study that it's not sufficient to simply familiarize infants to the exemplars. So we uh, did this condition which you familiarize infants with, with the same um, uh, images, same similar, but presenting in a uh, intermixed, in, uh, interleaved uh, manner, which we knew from previous work, uh, does not lead to category learning. And so in this case, there was indeed both no category learning and no generalization of the label that was provided for one of the exemplars. And this is just to, to show you uh, that indeed in this condition, infants did not look uh, longer at the correct referent uh, compared to the, the block categories condition, which they look longer at the correct referent uh, in the generalization trial. But this is what um, reviewer two um, asked the question of, uh, well, clearly you, you show that infants can do this, but who issues a grouping of examples in the world? So basically the question is that the disability is there, but is it actually something that infants ever do in, in, in their lives? Um, and it is true that we know, I and mean, this is what was based, was the basis of this condition, that we know that category learning is highly sensitive to how exemplars are encountered. Uh, so this is the work we used as basis for the study, young, younger fearing, uh, showed that if uh, exemplars are interleaved, there's no category learning, or if they, uh, the categories are actually very similar physically, infants may even learn an overall category. Um, and we also know that infants, um, younger infants require simultaneous presentation of exemplars in order to learn the category. And we also know that the order in which exemplars are experienced actually changes the nature of representation of the category with strong recency effects, which is not really what you uh, want from a, a truthful category representation. So is perceptual category learning actually an artifact of experimental conditions we create in the lab? By perceptual category learning meaning uh, categories learned in an unsupervised way. Now, I think what we responded uh, to the reviewer's comment was that, yeah, of course, uh, someone creates order, caregivers probably create uh, order in the inverse environment, so creating the conditions for them to learn categories, 
but then it's also, and this is this was uh, also inspired by um, Marge's uh, work uh, showing that caregivers um, organize children's exposure to categories are depending on what category they they want to teach. But it's also likely that if they do that, there are labels involved. So it's uh, unlikely that there would be uh, this kind of pedagogical situation that creates order, but in the absence of language, which is again not the the the. Uh, the category matching strategy that uh, that uh, I wanted, we want to demonstrate. Of course, it's also possible that there's just a lot of order in the world uh, that uh, uh, humans create, but not necessarily pedagogical condition. Indeed, uh, um, at the kitchen, at the um, meal time, their hands and glasses and chairs, a variety, uh, cars. There are lots of cars in the street, there are shoes organized in a rack, there are leaves, uh, and often uh, uh, animals are grouped together in, in fields. However, it's quite difficult to quantify this order. It would be uh, amazing if someone was actually uh, um, uh, able uh, and interested in, in doing this kind of quantification. But in the absence of this, of this data, another way of uh, asking the question uh, of whether um, uh, unsupervised category learning is possible is to see if there's any evidence for uh, uh, category knowledge acquired prior to arriving to a lab. Um, so this would be uh, evidence uh, that uh, infants had the category knowledge before, uh, uh, before arriving to a lab. So Studies using habituation, for example, are not suitable to do this because you pre repeatedly present exemplars, so that produces category learning. Novelty preference, uh, so preference for novel um, category over all category also depends on, on habituating infants, so that's not a, uh, a way of measuring prior category knowledge. Um, and my uh, brief uh, uh, review of literature actually doesn't find many uh, alternative parties, but I will, I will uh, share with you what uh, I have found. Also, um, important, the, the question I'm, I'm interested in is whether this knowledge has been acquired in the absence of language, and few of these studies have actually asked this question. But what have I found? So there is some work that look at prior knowledge. There are, for example, studies that look at uh, uh, how prior exposure to pets at home affects children's category learning in the lab, but of course, um, the, these studies that is generally ex experienced with one exemplar, and they don't actually test uh, category knowledge before, uh, um, showing that this prior knowledge affects learning in the lab. So uh, the, this study here did actually a habituation study and showed that uh, children that had pets at home were faster uh, to, to habituate and learn. And they've also not, Ask the question of whether um, of whether uh, this uh, knowledge is acquired with or without language. Then there are studies that uh, measure spontaneous sorting of objects uh, in the lab. So in this case, you give infants exemplars of cows and uh, um, birds, for example, and you look at how they play with this. Um, and um, in this study, in particular study, the way, the order in which uh, this 18 months old played with this example was not random, uh, but was um, actually played with more examples of one category before switching to the next, which is interpreted as evidence of them categorized, having knowledge of those categories. But again, I'm, again, the inventory present here with a variety of exemplars from the same category, so is this showing prior category knowledge? Probably, um, and the question of whether this was acquired with or without language was not asked. Uh, then there are studies that don't uh, necessarily uh, look at prior category knowledge, but they uh, looked at learning of categories in conditions that are similar to what would happen in real life, which is that the examplars are uh, experienced in various contexts or not uh, altogether grouped. So this is um, a study in which infants saw various exemplars of this box spotted box in different rooms. And interestingly, in this study, they found that infants uh, only learned or only uh, made an inference when uh, the, this box was accompanied by a pur purple glove in all these contexts. So it seems like a, a, some kind of category marker that maybe functions like a label was needed 
also the study didn't actually test category knowledge. They, what they tested here was the infant's ability to, uh, to um, 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 separate, individuate this object. So category knowledge is inferred. So and is, any, uh, uh, is there any evidence that would satisfy those conditions? So possibly, so um, here I suggest that uh, um, a study, a uh, series of studies that we ran with, uh, with Gergo many years ago and then uh, recently with Basha might provide this evidence. So we show that uh, particular EEG marker of category knowledge is absent for familiar objects whose labels the infant did not know. And I'm going to un unpack this. So what is this EEG marker of prior category knowledge? So in order for the uh, uh, marker um, to reflect category knowledge, so in, in our case, uh, what we uh, base it on is this property that uh, exemplar should be treated as equivalent and different from out of category. Uh, exemplars, and in order for this to be a prior knowledge, we uh, measure this uh, uh, marker in a situation that we know doesn't lead to learning the category in a lab, so they see examples that are intermixed. So this is uh, the paradigm we show here, uh, infants, a variety of uh, objects that they are familiar with, um, so for example, shoe, um, and they, uh, these objects are occluded, and then uh, upon revealing the object, there are two different changes. So either the object re remains the same, or there are changes within the category, or there's a change to an out of category uh, exemplar. And we measure here a particular EEG response called the NC in response to this change, and basically what we expect what we treat as a measure of category knowledge is that the, the NC will, will be stronger when there's a, a change across category than within the category. These are 12 months old infants. So this is indeed what we saw for objects uh, for which uh, parents told us that uh, infants actually had labels. So this is how we uh, checked for uh, um, prior knowledge of, this, uh, of these categories. Uh, there is a, a strong response to when uh, the category border is uh, crossed, but not no change when a shoe is replaced with a different shoe, um, which happens when they are presented with exemplars of categories they are not familiar with. So if a hedgehog is replaced with another hedgehog, they notice the difference, um, and they also, of course, notice the difference, the change between a hedgehog and a stapler, for example. And this is uh, um, a study that we replicated, um, an experiment we replicated in the same study, uh, but we also replicated uh, it by uh, making sure that these differences were not caused by any differences in the physical properties of the object and were also not due to, uh, to language because this is how we, we chose the, the familiar objects in the first studies based on parental report of infants knowing the labels of those. So in a follow-up study, we now used hedgehogs and staplers and we trained infants to perceive those as categories um, or we simply familiarize them with them. And so what we see is the same pattern when infants perceive them as categories, there's a strong uh, response to a change between categories, uh, but they continue to see, to notice the change between two hedgehogs when they have only been familiarized with them. In addition to this, in the same study, we noticed another very interesting pattern, which is that there was a specific uh, EEG signature of familiar and unfamiliar categories already um, before occlusion. So what we uh, saw here, what we observed is that there was uh, um, gamma uh, band activity when infants were looking at objects belonging to familiar categories, whether having labels or not. Um, and there was beta band activity throughout both presentation and occlusion um, for objects that were unfamiliar. Um, and in order to, to test, further test whether this distinction actually maps on, on category representation, uh, we derived the category index from the uh, NC uh, measure, and which reflects both the difference between across and within changes and between within and same. So basically, the, the larger this different, the difference between across and within changes, and the smaller this difference, the bigger this index. And we see that gamma band activity when the infant looks 
at the object before occlusion uh, and beta band activity uh, also the representation associate with this category index so there's a actual parametric uh, association between the two which suggests that gamma and beta activity when uh, looking at these objects already before they are hidden from view already reflects a cat the, the infant uh, uh, has a category representation for, for those uh, images. Now, a bit of a digression, because some of you might uh, wonder why, why gamma beta, and uh, I'm afraid I cannot say anything uh, very insightful. Um, so uh, there is some work in, uh, in animal models suggesting that there this gamma and beta band work in uh, op opposite way with uh, an increase in gamma and decrease in beta associated with maintaining object information memory. Uh, in the macaques, and often these studies use actually familiar categories, but I have never asked the question whether this reflects category knowledge. It's also unclear whether this is about category content. Um, this might be suggested by uh, this association with the parametric uh, difference between uh, changes across within uh, category, but also we know um, from this study um, that we did years ago with Gergo that labeling only one exemplar increases gamma activity. So unclear whether this uh, measures category content or, or conceptualization. Um, and also, uh, this is in, in response to uh, an earlier talk by Melissa. Um, that is this evidence that uh, uh, category knowledge, conceptual knowledge, uh, uh, leads to a uh, different format of encoding information. So there's gamma for familiar categories and beta for uh, unfamiliar, fam uh, unfamiliar categories. So does this suggest that there is conceptual encoding, uh, a non-feature encoding for some of them? I don't think that it necessarily uh, means that, although I think this is probably the easiest and straightforward conclusion to draw, but uh, um, I don't think necessarily. Um, so now having this, uh, um, the marker, the gamma band activity, um, this marker of category knowledge, do we see any evidence that using this marker that infants uh, can learn categories in the absence of language uh, in, in the real world? A study with Basha cannot tell us that because although we measure prior knowledge with the way we selected the objects is by asking parents whether infants had labels for them, so uh, we don't know that those were possibly learned um, uh, with the presence of labels. But um, in the, our previous study um, uh, with Gergo uh, and Nagi, we actually particularly uh, asked whether uh, there was a difference between, uh, in representation between objects that have been lexicalized and non-lexicalized. So basically we asked parents to give us examples of familiar uh, objects that infants did not have labels for. And the kind of, we gave them a list, and the uh, objects that most commonly came up were things like leaf or bag or chair or lamp. And interesting, what we find for those category is that there is no increase in gamma activity. So we see that compared to unfamiliar, uh, completely unfamiliar uh, categories, um, uh, label categories or name uh, categories like banana have an increase in gamma but uh, seeing bags and, and chairs, uh, uh, th those uh, evoke as much gamma as unfamiliar objects. So this is uh, again compatible with this idea that word exposure could category exemplars in the absence of labels does not lead to category labeling. So maybe going back to the initial question of how children may uh, acquire uh, extension of, of the words that they learn, maybe actually category matching, although uh, possible, is a very rare uh, or unlikely uh, strategy. Um, and this is mainly because uh, the conditions uh, for uh, learning categories uh, in the absence of language, so these co-occurrence of examples are, are rarely met. Now, I, as I said, uh, uh, I'm, I'm very aware that actually none of the piece of evidence that I have given is strong evidence that categories are not learned in the real world or outside the lab. Uh, but I also think that there is not strong evidence that they are. Um, and of course, uh, 
Uh, in the absence of uh, better evidence, what I can provide is at least uh, 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 more guidance of what the research should be to, to be addressing this question or what am I suggesting is actually happening. So what I'm suggesting is that actually um, labels are important, maybe not in a way that was suggested by studies uh, from Waxman or Atman labs, but maybe labels are particularly critical for bringing together exemplars across uh, time and space. So maybe um, what they do, what labels do, is uh, uh, reactivate members of previous exemplars and creating these core currents in the absence of core currents, which are, then allows uh, uh, for the infants to, to discover both the category and extend the label. It also may, it's likely the case that labeling is not that rare. It may be rare at meal times when there are more important things to do. But we know that actually in, uh, uh, in the lab, in experimental situation, uh, when parents are given the opportunity to use or not use label uh, to introduce new objects, actually labels are prioritized. So, uh, so maybe there are actually more uh, uh, favorable conditions than, than we thought. So what we uh, should be doing, and uh, uh, what I would like to do is to use these uh, markers of category knowledge that we described, and uh, um, one actually good thing about this EEG marker is that it could be used with infants of any age, so um, um, a method like uh, spontaneous sorting is less available to very young infants uh, who are maybe, uh, less motorically able. But this, the EG markers could be used at any age. So we could be using these markers to look uh, at how critical labels are. For example, uh, would um, uh, labeling restore learning of interspersed categories or diminish order effects? Or more importantly, using these mar markers, uh, could we show that there's actually poor category knowledge in these infants that are not exposed to language before they are exposed to language? So this would be the strongest evidence that language is critical for learning categories. Now there's very, very little research in this population, uh, also because like, of historical reasons, because cochlear implants have only become available recently. Um, but there is, uh, there are observations, I mean, these cases are not more frequent now than before. So there's actually a rich observations of, uh, of deaf uh, people not exposed for language for a long time. Um, and these are summarized uh, um, in this book by Oliver Sacks in Voices, which I have read, uh, with really great expectation of a Christmas, looking for the evidence that uh, this, uh, Individuals that have not been exposed to language do not possess category knowledge, and the, but basically over and over in the book, uh, we see this largely assumed um, uh, um, thing, fact that perceptual category learning is actually intact. So what uh, I read over and over is that yet more abstract categories are not uh, available, but cats and dogs and chairs uh, the, these individuals have them. So, of course, uh, uh, this, there are uh, good reasons why that may, may be the case. So, again, going back to what caregivers do, uh, caregivers pedagogically ostensibly create order, or, and although these infants may not uh, have language available in this interaction, uh, maybe the way caregivers organize the world for children is conducive to learning uh, categories. Labels may not be unique, there may be other uh, cues to, to category um, uh, um, belonging, appartenance, so there could be non-linguistic uh, category markers, and for example, predicates like function have been suggested were artifacts, uh, and I don't know what the, uh, the equivalent might be for uh, non-artifacts, like animals, uh, but maybe things like animal sounds or actions can also work as category placeholders um, and lead to category learning in the absolute language, which then uh, can, can be mapped onto newly learned words. And finally, a last thought is, well, why does grouping things help infants learn categories? So the obvious uh, um, uh, explanation there is that it just helps them notice similarities. You show them two dogs, they see that they are 
uh, similar. But then we've also seen that fast mapping is very hard, so just presenting to staplers uh, to them is not enough. That the similarity is not in the face. It's available, but it's not necessarily observable. Um, and um, most objects are very complex. There's, there's an infinite number of features that may or may not be similar. So maybe what uh, is happening there, there's additionally, in addition to, to the fact that um, the comparison becomes available, maybe um, grouping also works as an additional ostensi queue, um, uh, uh, queue to, uh, to this being an intentional um, uh, event in the world. And we know that infants expect humans to create order, and we know that humans create order to demonstrate knowledge. Um, so uh, just, again, uh, one last speculative comment is uh, um, uh, whether grouping is uh, uh, what we works through the ways that we initially thought it would. So to conclude, um, what I think this uh, this collection of work suggests is that uh, that these fossil perceptual categories are never learned in an unsupervised manner in the world or in the lab. Um, and the language may be important for, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, category um, matching may not necessarily be a strategy to reach uh, children learn uh, language. However, uh, it is not at the same time critical, which uh, is positive for this, the case of these infants that are not um, exposed to language initially because there are possibly alternative ways for discovering uh, the categories. Thank you. I'm surprised that Luca doesn't. Thank you. Uh, hi, that was a really nice talk. Um, I just want to mention one thing. I'm working with non autism, which I think is really relevant for this talk. So I don't know whether you are familiar with this population. Those are children, but also adults that don't acquire expressive language, so they only produce language at the uh, level of single words. And in case of comprehension, um, in general, the comprehension is quite low, so always be uh, chronological age. These are children and, and obviously adults that are older than five years old, so, and they still don't acquire language only at the minimal, minimal level. And what I observe from my research is that, um, so I said they only produce single words, and in um, really uh, rarely. And what I observe is that the nature maybe of these words is also different. So they don't produce them, from my observation, across time and space. Uh, what, what you actually mentioned in this slide. So what I mean by this is that they don't produce them um, when the object is not there in the context and they don't see the object. So they don't produce the word. Uh, when they don't see the object or, you know, in across time. So I don't know how to, how to explain. Um, so in this case, I think this, this is really relevant for this, for this talk, for what you were mentioning. Um, it's also interesting to ask, so how is their categorization? And there actually is one test, a clinical test that we use, which is sorting of objects and about one third of this population can manage to sort different looking uh, objects that kind of uh, are of the same category, so different looking spoons. Uh, and I actually wanted to uh, ask you about what is your intu intuition in this population. So what I can see is that they can categorize, but I think it's more like a perceptual category and it might be of, of a different kind as the, the categories that normally are, uh, we say, associated to, to words. <laughs> so category learning is possible, but it may be of a different <coughs> nature. 
So I didn't hear what is the actual population. Sorry, uh, I nonverbal, missed. Nonverbal autism. Autism. Mm -hmm, but nonverbal yeah. autism. Nonverbal autism, yes. Yeah, so I mean, my first comment would have been to, for, to make sure that category learning is possible. So it's uncle mm -hmm. unclear whether it hasn't happened because maybe don't, they don't use labels to learn categories and no other options are available to them or whether it's actually a, a difficulty with learning even in conditions that would be favored to category learning. So I would first check that they can learn categories. Well, the interesting thing is that, you know, these are children that are, all, you know, unlike deaf children, they are immersed in language from birth, but still don't acquire yeah, uh, But language. the problem could still be mm. either at the uh, linguistic level, so mm -hmm. using language to acquire categories, or at perceptual level. So uh -huh. you still have to ask the question of where the, the issue is. But it's a very interesting observation. Mm, but well, what I mentioned is at the perceptual level, at least one third of the population can categorize objects. OK, so, so despite none of them having language, some of them mm -hmm. can. Yes. But still, yeah. Well, I just thought to mention this because yeah. it's really yeah. relevant. And in, in general, this yeah. population yeah. is not talked about in, in during this year. Yeah. In, yeah. But also, we topic. know that some of them may not produce language, but they still understand language. OK, valid. So if I manage to understand your point is that uh, category learning, unsupervised uh, supervised category learning is problematic because uh, exemplars are not grouped together. But uh, I, I think there is a third way in which infants tend to sometimes uh, construct their experience actively for themselves. So for example, uh, uh, learning progress theories of, of curiosity uh, tend to uh, highlight this point uh, very much. So they m might be able to uh, somehow create order themselves uh, by these mechanisms. Yeah, and I thank you very much for this comment. And uh, it's indeed something that I've been thinking of but then decide not to put in a talk because if, um, although I fully agree that infants construct their experiences, they clearly don't do that in this, not even in the studies in which examples are interleaved. So they could be selecting to pay attention to only one of the categories, but they don't. Um, and also selection requires already uh, uh, them uh, uh, noticing similarities to know what to select. So I think it doesn't solve the, the issue. Okay, so let, let, let me ask a, a question yes. <laughs> as well. So it sounds to me very unlikely that infants and children wouldn't learn the, the general statistics of the world without any linguistic or, 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 or social input. I mean, it sounds very, very unlikely that they don't learn it. So, so the question is, perhaps the issue here is that the kind of tests that you and others apply to test their category knowledge uh, is not testing that kind of perceptual level of, of, uh, of, of categorization, but are testing whether, whether, they, whether they extend it to a cons practically the, the distinction here between, between perceptual categories versus concepts. So whether, whether all the tests that you, uh, that you used are testing their conceptual mm -hmm. knowledge, which of course doesn't necessarily extend mm -hmm. to perceptual categories, but it sounds to me very unlikely that, that that this uh, 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 statistical learning wouldn't go on. So what would be a test to test? I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I will think. Uh, there's a question there. Um, hi, so I have two questions. Um, so about this language being required for a category learning issue, um, what about all non-human animals? which I uh, show that even monkeys have uh, gamma activity in response. Um, yes, yeah, so, so I don't think that language is the only way to it. And this is why I suggested that there are possibly other category markers that, uh, that animals may be using, that maybe functions or predicates work in the same way. Um, and then maybe there is 
the, the categories are limited to things that are experienced more <coughs> in groups, like packs of wolves and apples in a tree. I, I'm wondering if maybe uh, a different distinction might be at play, which is um, presumably as I go down through the animal kingdom, I get to some creature that has some categories but does not have a propositional language of thought. Um, is the distinction you have in mind actually a distinction between non-propositional category formation and propositional tags for categories? Yeah, I mean, I think this is similar to, to Gergel's question. Um, well, then, I, uh, then I'm in good company. Um, and and uh, I, I mean, to me, the, the issue, I don't think it's just that, because really the issue is um, knowing what you need to put together. So uh, how do we decide which things go together, since the similarity is not obvious? So seeing a horse today and seeing a horse tomorrow is in itself not sufficient, because the similarity is not available unless something tells us that they should be put together through a, a category marker. So um, there may be some, there may be a memory trace that, but no, I think this is not a distinction. I think even non-propositional learning may not occur just because it is, you have no cues to what you should be putting together in a category in the absence of this okay, marker. Okay, so that brings up my last comment. Sorry that I made multiple comments, but um, this issue about clustering um, needing or, or helping learning. Um, every analysis uh, suggests that the world is highly clustered. Mm. So um, you can do this at the pixel level. So if you just, because humans are situated and because the most typical movement is zero movement in the world, then the most likely pixels for me to experience are exactly the ones I just experienced. Um, it, it's overwhelming. It's the modal number is the modal the modal response for distance traveled, moment by moment is zero, distance traveled. So things are pretty stable in our world, right? But and we're pretty stable in our world. Yeah. Um, that doesn't even bring up psychology about the things I attend to. I tend to want to attend to, again, right? And that leads to a structure in the world whereby. Um, clustering naturally emerges. You don't, you don't have to have um, some agent creating structure. But that kind, that level of, uh, of uh, similarity is not the kind that would help you extract category relevant information. I, no, I, th I think it does. Yeah. You think it does? Yeah. Okay. Okay, I think we can finish here, thank you.